and I'm happy to pass this off to you, Michael. Great, thank you. Well, uh, Chris, Brian, Stephanie, thanks for joining us tonight. We're uh, still trying to blow up Twitter and get people to uh, hop on, but thank you for being here and for sharing a little bit of information already about yourselves. Uh, excited to have a CS person and a makerspace person for sure, and we'll find out what Stephanie's doing. This might be perfect. We'll just ask each of you, like, how do we blend what we're doing, and, and we don't even have to share anything. Uh, but we'll share a little bit. We did come prepared. We've got kind of, a, I won't say a top 10 list, but 10 options, ways that you can start to integrate computer science with making. Uh, my background, I was a AP computer science teacher at a high school, had an opportunity to uh, open the first fab lab in the state of Tennessee in a public school. Uh, did that back three or four years ago now, and I'm just really enjoying uh, getting to do a lot of work in sort of both spaces. So I spend a lot of time in my role working with uh, public school teachers, um, both on the computer science side of things, but also we uh, just finished a, uh, a big grant from Volkswagen um, here in southeast Tennessee, a uh, million dollar grant opening uh, 17 digital fabrication labs in schools. So this is right in my, my passion spot. I want to introduce to you, to get started tonight, our special guest. This is Joshua Snyderman. He's a former Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow at the U.S. Department of Energy and is currently the VP of, the VP, Vice President uh, at Learning Blade, which is a, uh, a STEM career awareness uh, program. And uh, I've known Josh for a couple years now. He just does awesome work. So Josh is going to kick us off here tonight. Hey, everyone. Um, and I... Uh... Uh, Michelle had mentioned that uh, we can mute ourselves, but I think with a small room and the expertise in the room, it would be spectacular if this turned into a conversation. Yeah. So um, as Michael said, you know, we've got 10 slides, but this is being recorded. And so if we're all sharing, um, I think that just makes it great. So uh, please do uh, unmute yourselves uh, when you when you want to chime in and just do that. Um, as Michael said, I work at a company called Learning Blade. Uh, we, we try and focus on career awareness, so we think it's really important for students to recognize careers in computer science as well as the skills in computational thinking. Um, and, uh, but, you know, for me, the idea of mixing computer science with making is what's really unique about these top 10 items is to try and, you know, uh, stimulate student tinkering and inquiry um, around computer science with the joy of hands-on making experiences. So, Let's just dive right into it. Um, our, first pro our first concept for you guys to uh, kick it off in your makerspace slash computer science innovation in K5 is Makey Makey. So um, in the chat box, maybe with a yes or no, or uh, who's used Makey Makey? And if you're a yes, then I'm going to call on you to turn off your microphone and uh, turn on your microphone and share some stories. Chris Combs is a no. Stephanie's a no. Oh, man, you guys... You're gonna love this. I, I, I really, Jamie's a no, this is great. So I feel like we're, we're providing you a value already in this conversation. Yes. Um, Makey Makey is one of the coolest cyber physical ways to engage the real world, the physical world around you with your computer. So you can turn everyday objects into a touchpad. So essentially, it's all it requires is an alligator clip. There's no programming. So it just plugs into your computer and boom, you've got alligator clips attached to the Makey Makey. And then what you can do is you can explore the physical world. It's truly an exceptional tool. Um, Michael, I saw a picture of Michael, uh, project Michael did with his kids was to create a, um, and I don't mean to steal your thunder, Michael, but he created an operation, the game operation out of Makey Makey and tinfoil and a cardboard. And so his kid, the, the you know, students cut the cardboard and then put you know tinfoil around the edges and use Makey Makey to set off the alarm. Um, the, the traditional Makey Makey starts off with using bananas as a piano or uh, as drums, but it really goes, it, it's incredible. You could use this in physical education. There's, there's PE teachers who put tinfoil on different sides of the room. And when kids run and touch the tinfoil, it creates, it's really about conductivity too. It's a science concept. But when you touch the Makey Makey, you know, object that conducts, that can, can be conductive, all of a sudden, you know, you, you ping and you pong. So you could play Tetris in gym class, but you got to run across the room. Um, Makey Makey is just, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It connects the world to your computer in, in interesting ways. Um, 
Josh, can I throw in a tip on that? Yes, please. Yeah, so one of the things that we see a lot with teachers, so one of, one of the things we love about it, it works with Chromebooks, so it doesn't re, it does not work with tablets yet. They're still working on that. Uh, there's a there's a Bluetooth version that, that's in beta right now, uh, but it plugs in via USB. It'll work with Chromebook, laptop, desktop, whatever, basically anything that has a USB connection, and it essentially is just remapping the keyboard. So like instead of pressing the left arrow on your keyboard, you press whatever, a banana, aluminum foil, like Josh was alluding to. Um, if you invest in these, one of the things we really recommend, scour like your school tech closet for leftover Cat5 cable, because Cat5 cable is stranded copper wire, and so you can use that to make these. He was talking about, we had a teacher that ran Cat5, like old Cat5 cable across the whole gym, and had his kids playing uh, Tetris, like literally having to run across the gym, and he just, he just scoured the school for, for like leftover wires and cords. It was a really cheap solution. Um, the make you make is about 50 bucks to get started and they're very uh, teacher friendly So if you call them and tell them you're an educator, uh, they'll give you a discount as well um, Hey, Jamie, thanks for joining uh, Jamie. Have you used makey makey and as you're typing your answer to that? I want to point out a nice connection with one of my favorite inspirational videos um, Kane's arcade uh, Kane's arcade is an incredible story about making about imagination um, and, and what Kane's Arcade has led to, and, and you, if you haven't seen Kane's Arcade, you really should, uh, it's, it'll, it'll probably make you cry. I share it at every professional development I, I do. Um, but what it turned into is something called the Cardboard Challenge, which is an international day of let's play with cardboard. But some of the videos on Cardboard's Challenge is about using Makey Makey. So they have kids making like little fake basketball shooters. But the makey makey is keeping the score because when the basketball hits the makey makey on the score thing, it's you, there's lots of ways of integrating the computer science. And that's what tonight's about is I'm talking about, like, how can you take computer science principles and integrate it into this making? And uh, makey makey is the is really an excellent example. So to, to speak to that, Josh, how the, the computer science piece of this plays in. Right. So makey makey gives you that physical button and a, a student's a way to like whether you're talking about, you know, bananas or Play-Doh or aluminum foil. To interact with the computer so you can see like at an early age that really increases engagement but what Josh was talking about with like the basketball counter the CS piece comes in and that because you're using these triggered events of you know up arrow was pressed or pressed the left arrow pressed the space bar you're able to code the kids can code in things like scratch I mean basically any language that uses triggered events they can make their little app their little game uh, but certainly I mean we're all we're all usually pretty familiar with scratch in the CS world um, especially in K-5, and uh, it's just a great opportunity to give kids a way to interact with their scratch creations in a way that just is just more fun and engaging, a little more tactile. Yep. So because we have more slides, we're going to keep moving, but this is probably, there's a reason we put this at the front of our top 10 list. Um, they're not all sequentially in order, but Michael and I both think Maggie Makey's an exceptional uh, device, especially in K-5, uh, but really in all grades. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, um, unplugged activities. So this is an opportunity to really engage students in, uh, hey, Julie, this is really a great opportunity to, 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 in K-5, to bring computer science principles into the classroom in a way where they're learning algorithmic thinking, they're learning coding concepts, but in a, not right in front of the computer all the time, right? So you have a chance of of really designing instructional strategies around that um, using logic parameters, if then statements. So the human robot is, I, I've done this with adults, I've done it with kids, it's classic. Um, you know, you get students to give, to write an instruction list for something like make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, but then the students have to, uh, after they've written their list, they read it and the robot then performs the action. And what they start to realize in this human robot um, activity is that there are some missing pieces to their code, to their instructions for making this work. And that's one of the um, great, you know, uh, ways of starting to get kids to think about this. So as you're doing the human robot, of course, in the making space, you could, you could add layers to that with kids really taking it up a notch in how they uh, make you know, accessorize accessories for that robot and things of that nature. Um, Michael, you have anything to add on the human robot? No, man, you're you're killing that. 
Yeah. So it's really, you know, I think part of it is teaching. You can teach if then propositions um, in the human robot. You can do a lot of things, but it's really for the younger grades, really for all ages, this works. But in the younger grades, it's really important to do the unplugged events. So you might want to Google CS Unplugged. I'm sure many of you out there are, are big fans of unplugged activities. Um, so, hey, Julie, I'm glad you're a big fan. We're a big fan of you. Um, so, hey, uh, please do unplug your microphones and share. Has anyone tried unplugged activities? And what's your favorite? Type it into the chat box or just chime in with your microphone. We'd like to make this a little more interactive for everybody. And I'm hoping people know how to turn off their microphone and join the conversation. Um, Michelle, have we set it so they can do that? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Who's that? Okay, this is Chris from Indiana. Hey, Chris. Well, um, one of the human robot things I use, I have pair the kids up and then have one hide an item and they have to write the instructions on how to find it. And then we have the other partner demonstrate it on, and then I stop them and correct them when they assume that to do something like stand up, they didn't tell the person how to stand up or push their chair out or, you know, it says turn right, turn left. What's the degree. And so That's right. uh, That's right. after the first couple think I'm a little too critical then the others, you know, start, tweaking their instructions to make sure that they're more specific. Well, thank you for that. That's, that's a great example. And out of curiosity, do you add any graphing and mapping into that so they can look at two dimensional maps of maybe where the items hidden and things of that nature? Uh, not yet, but that, that's a thought. Uh, I only have the kids for nine weeks. So uh, yeah. trying to cram everything in is kind of tough sometimes. All right. Anyone else with unplugged? It doesn't have to be the human robot. Anyone else with uh, favorite unplugged activities in the chat box or on the microphone? Okay. Well, feel free to add to that chat. We're going to move on to the next slide. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff to share with you. Um, Tinkercad. So again, I like asking this question so we know the lay of the land here. Um, Who's used Tinkercad before? So yes or no in the chat box would be great. Um, I am a big fan of Tinkercad. So Julie, yes. Um, so Tinkercad is a program you use to modify. It's like Google SketchUp, but it's uh, really designed to create your STL files for 3D printing. Um, and we're going to talk about a couple layers uh, in Tinkercad. But on a principal layer, uh, Tinkercad really is getting students interested in computer science. It, it really is because a lot of the design elements and the features of thinking three-dimensionally in a two-dimensional space and using different tools and rotations is an excellent opportunity for young people to start thinking um, conceptually in their, in their brain. And yet it's so simple to use. Um, and so Brian's used it, that's great. Uh, I uh, have seen an eight an eight year old take to Tinkercad in ten minutes of instruction. Hey, this is the button to group things. This is the button to ungroup things, and here's the button to hollow out things. Now go. And an hour later, they created their own jewelry stand that they could use. So it's free, as Michael's pointing out. Uh, works on Chromebooks. And uh, and Greg, why don't you tell it? Can you chime in with us a microphone and tell us about your fidget spinners? And then. Uh, and then other people, Julie, maybe how you how you you have used it. It's okay if you're not in the mood to get on the microphone. I don't have that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, hey, Greg. Hello. Sorry, I said uh, video only, and I was anyway. Uh, yeah, boy teen. Um, He's actually boy teen now. He was boy child, I think, at the time. Uh, well, first of all, I remember when I first did sketch, wait, no, sketch, scratch, and I brought, brought it home to show him, and he was, I was like, look what I did in scratch. He's like, oh, oh, that's nothing. Look what I did. And so Julie, I guess because of Julie, he already had done scratch. But uh, we have access to Tinkercad, of course, in, on all of our devices, but at our library here in town, they have a 3D printer that 
all you have to do is have a library card. And of course, uh, Boyteen found some designs of others when the fidget spinners were all the craze. Uh, so we found some and we got on Tinkercad and he modified them and started printing his own. And of course, he wanted to take them to school to sell, but uh, that's, I guess, just where you normally go after you start creating your own fidget spinners. But there you go. Great. Well, that's it. I appreciate it. And Julie, it sounds like you had a role in that. You want to turn your mic on and share your uh, Tinkercad story, and then we'll move on to the next slide? Yeah. Um, I don't think that I talked You just speak up a little bit. Yet, but I'm not sure. Um, but we've used Tinkercad at our school um, for 3D printing. Most recently, we were in a design thinking competition, and our students adjusted things that they found on Tinkercad to best meet their needs because we were quickly having to make some items for a display. I think the hardest part for me, and I guess I um, hadn't thought of it as the way you just suggested, but finding the time to use um, the 3D printer well with a large class has been a big struggle for yeah. us um, in terms of teaching them up front how to use it and then getting everything printed is uh, Absolutely. a huge time strain on us. Yeah. So one of the apps we're going to, one of the, the things we're going to show later in the uh, presentation um, is a, an interesting feature. It's not out yet, but um, coming soon from Tinkercad is going to be integration with some augmented reality pieces. And, um, oh, sorry, I'm going to back up that slide there. Um, and uh, you're going to be able to export your 3D design in Tinkercad uh, to an augmented reality file. Uh, so you could use with like the merge cubes or a number of the augmented reality apps that are coming out. Um, so it, it would allow students to have a meaningful 3D development experience without having to wait for a 3D printer, because that's certainly a reality. I mean, even if you have a dozen 3D printers, it's just the reality of the, the amount of time it takes to actually, you know, go from design to holding the object in your hand can be a bit uh, a bit challenging. For those of you that haven't used Tinkercad, um, a, a quick sort of sta staple feature, Tinkercad is 3D designed. It's a little different from some of the more robust programs. It's made by Autodesk. One of the things that separates it from like, um, like Fusion 360, which is certainly the more like industry standard three-dimensional design piece uh, so software package, they, Autodesk came out with Tinkercad as a way to, it, it's library-based. Um, design so students you have access to a library of tools and shapes so they the idea is that you would build these complex 3d models not from the ground up but by combining shapes and so you don't have to go through like um, the traditional development process where you're designing in 2d and then extruding but in you know digitally but instead you're able to just say like take a block and put a sphere on top of your block and then merge the two uh, so it's a pretty simple tool that it's nice because that reduces the learning curve um, in terms of getting started, but it's a pretty robust tool in that you can really get into some pretty fanciful designs um, using some interesting strategies. So we really like it because it's, it's accessible to students as early as realistically second or third grade. They can start um, having some pretty nice experiences with it, uh, but you can use it well into high school and, and get into some pretty uh, significant 3D design. So it's really a nice range of uh, from, from specifically from a 3D design standpoint, a nice range of skill development for students. And, and just a quick plug for the company I work at, Learning Blade, we do all of our designing for our 3D printed lessons in Tinkercad because it, 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 it does the job um, even at an adult design level to make, to make some pretty cool projects. That's right. So that's a perfect segue. So Tinkercad has been, the, has been a staple uh, in recent years for uh, entry-level 3D design for students. Uh, but one of the things that we're most excited about, it would be very difficult to talk about the integration of making and computer science without talking about Arduino. The challenge is that this is the integration of making and computer science for elementary school, and Arduino is a little challenging um, for elementary school until all of a sudden uh, Tinkercad recently released uh, what they call Tinkercad circuits. So it's the same tool, the same website, same account, um, you make the one Tinkercad account, this is all accessible, but it's just a new option. And when you go to Tinkercad circuits, what we love about this is that for a student that's new to microcomputing, 
which is basically, uh, it seems like all students are still relatively new. Microcomputing is cheap, and the, the allure uh, of, of the whole idea is that you can buy microcomputers online for extremely low prices, right, like 5 to $7, uh, $12 for really, you know, bigger, kind of nicer ones. Uh, but you can get Arduinos easily in the 6 to $7 range. And you can use those as computers to control things from turning on LEDs to turning on, you know, controlling motors. Uh, you can attach motor shields. You can get into some pretty uh, intense computer science projects with them really quickly. The challenge is that they use sensors or some, in, some kind of input device to send a signal, process that, or receive a signal, process that signal, and then send some kind of digital or analog signal based on your preference for your design to control some external thing, right? So um, this could be as simple as a motion sensor that turns on an LED light uh, or a touch sensor that turns on a motor that has a fan attached, right? So it can be relatively simple things, but you have to use Arduino code to control those. Well, that, you can imagine, is a little bit challenging for students until Tinkercad released their circuits tool. Their circuits tool, I'm going to show you just some screenshots. So this is all screenshots from the, from the Tinkercad new circuit tool feature that's, that's just totally free. So you can drag in simple circuits. You can even drag in like a, just a coin cell battery and see what a coin cell battery, um, what would happen if you hook that up to an LED. But then you can go in and you can like, if you drop it in Arduino like this, yeah, it does. It looks exactly like Scratch. So they've built a Scratch-esque, um, <coughs> excuse me, they built a Scratch-esque uh, block-based programming language. So you can drag in these blocks and you can see they're really simplified, like, uh, block commands, right? Set LED to high, low, medium. Set pin 0, set pin 3. So these are all common uh, programming commands that you would use in Arduino text-based language, right? The, the, the traditional syntax. But you can now use it in this digital thing, or what's the, uh, in this uh, block-based language. But what's even cooler is after you build this, you can actually test the code and the digital like LED on the screen will light up if you programmed it properly. And if you haven't, either programmed it properly or hooked it up. So if you forgot your resistor, your LED will malfunction just like it would in the real world. So students are able to do all of their prototyping digitally without any uh, fear of, uh, you know, failure, like catastrophic failure to the device. And then it's, it's recording all of that so they can then go put these microcomputer components together in the physical world and, and you know, see if it works, see, see what happens. They even took it a step further, though. You have the option to code this in the block-based language or in the syntax, the, the Arduino language, and you can migrate back and forth natively in real time. So all embedded in this Tinkercad circuits, you can have an intense kind of high-level experience but you can, it is certainly a great starting point. We're, we've used this with fourth and fifth graders. Um, I think you could probably back it up to third grade. There's a little bit of reading, so literacy skills developed. That's going to be a little bit of a barrier for early elementary students. But this is a fascinating new way to introduce microcomputing to students. Sorry, that was a ton of information, but I'm just really excited about this. Has anybody used the Tinkercad circuits? Great question. Anyone use those? Yeah, Stephanie, we actually, we have a ninth grade ECS course here in Chattanooga that they're doing that. They, they absolutely love it. And, and that, you know, that you can buy Arduinos for so cheap and, and actually then go build this thing and code it for real and see if your LED works. Like, it's, it's a really seamless transition from sort of theoretical design to physical uh, functionality. Ah. I wish we saw some yeses so we could get ideas from all of you, but I'm loving that we see no's because it kind of makes, like, I know you're learning something new. This is a new tool. That's great. So, so taking this into the making world, uh, besides, you know, what you're making in the virtual space here, um, you know, there's a chance to do incredible things with paper circuits. Um, this, is, this is really one of the funnest activities in elementary school uh, that I think you could touch on, which is teaching kids how to use circuitry to design things. And, my favorite way of seeing this is sort of like an if-then statement where, where kids make, uh, they love to make cards that, you know, when you, when you do something with a card, you know, like you've gotten some crazy cards in your birthday sometime, but when something happens in the card and you pull on the tab or you do something, something lights up, the LED is tied to it, things happen. 
Um, so there's just a great opportunity to use what Michael was talking about in with there and then bring it into the real world and, and work with circuits, work with LED. Um, and it's pretty simple, you know, with conductive tape or they even make markers now, which I think is uh, extremely cool conductive ink. Um, and, and, you know, you can just use some, you know, the watch batteries uh, with LEDs. And so just a, a nice real world example of taking that uh, to the making space of things. Has anyone uh, ever done paper circuits? Or squishy before? circuits. Yeah, the squishy circuits are, are uh, go ahead, tell I'm me about that. I'm going to see if any of them got it. We'll let those share. Oh, cool. Brian. There we go, Brian. Tell us a story about paper circuits. Chime in. Turn on that microphone. Tell us what you know. And uh, so what about squishy circuits with Play-Doh? Have you guys tried those? Well, I've seen that at the NSTA conference. There's a, there's a great new Play-Doh uh, box style circuit kit. Um, that's okay, well, Brian, but thank you. Uh, if you could just explain a little bit how you do that literacy piece with your paper circuits in the chat, we'll all be uh, yeah. educated and uh, love and, Love and to see what while you're typing, there. just um, a quick plug: if you ever, if you have done paper circuits, paper circuits work on the exact same principle as makey makey, but without a controller, right? So paper circuits are essentially an on-off switch to control, like an LED traditionally, or or, or like a buzzer, right? Um, where makey makey is essentially the same thing. It's closing a circuit, but it, when it closes the circuit, your computer is is delivering a command instead of just turning on the LED. Let's see, we read a story in this thing. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad Brian pointed out that you read a story and then create a scene from the story with a paper circuit. Brian, if you could add some of the stories you've uh, talked about there. But that was one of the notes I had to myself, which was to really share with you guys in, in elementary the emphasis on bringing children's books into this space to motivate and to share that, um, that love of tinkering. Obviously, Maybe everyone's heard now of uh, Rosie Revere, engineer, and the, and the book Iggy Peck, architect, or Ada, Ada Twist, scientist. But there's just so many great books out there that you can bring in, build that literacy, and then go and tinker and toy. Um, so Diane, Brian's written, he's got the blackout, the darkest, uh, darkest dark, R2 that he uses. That's great. Um, um, as I was preparing for this, I was also thinking of some great books for making. Just want to share them. Invent to Learn is just an excellent book for, you know, how to how to get that making going, as well as <clears throat> Making and Tinkering by Kate uh, Harriman is a wonderful book. There it is. Michael's got oh, no, this is a different one. Making Makers by uh, Anne-Marie Thomas. If, uh, if you want to get your principal to believe that making matters, if, uh, if somebody in your school is like a leader doesn't believe it's good, we love this. It's kind of a manifesto. Check it out on Amazon. Great read. And I just added a link. Michael and I have been working on a book, so we it's a free ebook. Just shared it with you all. Um, but going to move on to the next slide here and pass the microphone to Michael. And this is the whiz bang wow <laughs> moment. So I want you guys all to really focus on the screen because this is okay. So I'm not going to ask how many of you have seen the Merge Cube. Uh, maybe you've seen it, maybe you have it, but it is, um, oh wow, I didn't know Invent to Learn was still free, that's awesome. Yeah, the Merge Cube is unbelievable. Chris, I'm glad you have one. We just bought, they, they were on sale for a dollar at Walmart, so we literally drove around our region to every Walmart and bought like 700 of them so we could give them away to teachers. Uh, I mean, at a dollar a piece, they're unbelievable. But I can't really explain what it's doing other than to say it's an augmented reality anchor. Uh, and it's kind of, oh, sorry, Greg, we'll give you one. And um, it's kind of hard to explain it. So, Michelle, if we could switch over here. Uh, we made just a quick video. We're actually going to post the, a full, like, five-minute tutorial and some classroom ideas on the uh, CS for All Teachers website. Uh, but I'll show you here real quickly. A, uh, I'm going to share my screen here. <clears throat> and sorry for the duplicity for a moment. Um, there we go. I'll make that big, and I'm assuming you can see this. 
<laughs> okay, so we're going to open the app. And just on my phone, this is the App Explorer. You see it's just video, and I had to slow it down so you'd see, because all of a sudden, when the phone cues on the, uh, on the, on the cube, like it just automatically places a digital artifact in physical space. So you can see there, I'm moving my phone around, and it's mapped this like full motion um, virtual representation of the solar system. And you'll see, you can tap on your phone, and it is like fully interactive. So you can get little tidbits. You can control things based on what you touch. Right now, there's about a dozen or so apps. About half of them are free. Um, there's a number of them that are in beta that are coming very soon. One of the ones we're most excited about um, allows people to, um, allows the user to create their own digital artifacts, uh, virtual artifacts, um, be able to place them wherever the cube is, and then there's an interactive button where they can actually place that digital artifact uh, in three-dimensional space, like as if it were on their desk, and then move the cube out of the way. So they could make multiple copies of the same artifact or of multiple artifacts and have them uh, in augmented reality displayed on, in, in their work environment. There are a ton of possibilities here. It is just really exciting technology. And for a buck, uh, man, totally recommend trying to find one of these. The online, they're a little more expensive. But if you'll drive around, Walmart's got a special deal on them all over the country right now. So definitely recommend checking those out. OK, I'm going to switch back and stop sharing my screen if I can figure that out. Ah, great. I think Michelle figured that out for me. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, let's see here. I'm seeing a lot of people saying, I have three. I got a bunch. Somebody tell me what you're doing with these and what you see them in the classroom. Paul has 70. Paul, have you used them in the classroom? Or Julie, can someone turn on their microphone and share a story about the Merge Cube? That would be great. This is recorded, so people will hear your story I think later. Julie was sharing. with our integrated units. So like our fourth grade right now is studying the solar system in science. And so uh, we're taking that in there for them to see. We're also studying space, um, different aspects of it in kindergarten. So we're using it in multiple ways, the Merge Cube. And honestly, I just regularly check to see what new app is out there to see how it would integrate with what's going on. I'm pretty uh, pumped about that concept that you shared earlier. Yeah, yeah. So I saw a question in the chat window about the, uh, the goggles. So we've done a little homework on those. We've ordered a pair, but don't have, the, don't have them in yet. But I can tell you, we actually, I have them here, um, just purchased a, uh, just, a, just like a regular Google Cardboard and just modified it by cutting out lens holes for our cam the camera on our phone. And it worked perfectly. Sorry, this is backwards. It worked perfectly uh, just dropping my phone in here and looking at those in the full video tutorial. I used this, and it worked great to let you have, like a, have both hands free so you could engage with the, uh, with the cube because you could just strap, strap the cardboard on. And you get the cardboard on Amazon for like 6 bucks. So it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, but their goggles aren't particularly expensive. I, if I remember right, they were like 15 something like that. Nicole, that's awesome. What a great idea for your uh, APCSP kids. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, slide, yeah, let's keep pushing here. OK, so the next one gets a little more intense. Um, and we tried our best to keep these as low cost or no cost as possible. But this one has a little bit of a cost in it. And it really kind of varies. So if you've ever looked, um, if, you're, if you're big in maker spaces or the digital fabrication space, I'm sure you visited Spark Fund's website before. Um, it's essentially like maker space stuff for schools uh, primarily. Um, although they certainly have a little bigger market than just the education market. Um, LilyPad has come out with a number of what they call snap circuits. And you can see a little visual representation here. There's several of them. And as this space does, they evolve quickly and change pretty, pretty fast. But they introduce a really interesting way for students to integrate um, computer science with making in a way that we don't typically think of making in school. So this is all about e-textiles, kind of wearables. Uh, essentially, the idea is these are analogous to um, uh, Arduinos right, or some, some other microcontroller. 
uh, they're not necessarily, you don't have to think about them in terms of a heavy amount of programming as much as it is sort of sending an electronic signal um, across conductive, uh, anything that's conductive. In particular, for e-textiles, they make uh, several lines of conductive thread. Uh, my recommendation, you can look at the conductive thread they sell alongside these from the same company. Uh, as is typical as a, a name brand accessory, it's expensive. But if you look on uh, other sites like Amazon, um, a lot of local uh, electronic stores will have them as well. You can buy conductive thread uh, for pretty cheap, um, like by, for, for what it is. And you're able to then like literally use the thread as if it were a copper wire. So you can wire up your clothing to have like integrated uh, surface mount LEDs or sound devices, right? Like integrated speakers. Um, you can make like drums or you know guitars that are embedded in your shirt that you could play. Uh, buttons in your wrist that you could hit to like make your back light up. I mean, just all kind of cool stuff. You could imagine where kids can go with this. Um, and this could also be done with like felt, so kids can make like ornaments, gifts, uh, and as they're making those things, it's forcing them to start thinking through some of the engineering principles from a, a like electrical engineering standpoint to really think about conductivity and circuitry and how you deal with parallel circuits and open and closed circuits and how you're controlling those. So most of these lily pads uh, sell under ten dollars each. They're reusable, and the majority of them run on coin cell batteries. So it's really a light lift in terms of the hardware integration, um, but it's a, it's a fascinating way to get kids interested in this kind of work. Uh, sorry for the brain dump there. Anybody ever use snap circuits or use anything from, from LilyPad, done anything in, in e-textiles? And as people are typing, I'm just going to point out, I had a vision in my head, and I, like you could say to your students, drum roll, please, and they would have pad it in and you get the drum roll. <laughs> oh. There you go, bookmark, hair bows, yeah, absolutely. Nicole, Great. Nicole, what grades have you used them in? And if you want to turn on your microphone and, and tell us a little bit more, we'd love to hear hear your well, story. Nice. <laughs> no problem. Okay, no problem. Um, so yeah, that's great. But so Nicole, you you how do your sixth graders the since this is a K five webinar? How do those sixth graders deal with your uh, with the lily pads? Are they they manage it well? Do you, could you envision it going down a few a few a few layers, a few grades? And I appreciate you all sharing with each other your ideas in the chat box. It's real nice. And Nicole scaffolds the activity with brainstorming. Love it. Spectacular. They draw their design and then make them. I mean, that's, that's fun learning. I want to be in Nicole's class. <laughs> Can I send my daughters to your class? What state are you in, Nicole? Do you run a summer camp? Tell me more. <laughs> um, because we have time constraints, we're going to keep moving on, if that's okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, I'd, have, I'd like to come visit. Uh, so moving on to the next thing. Um, if that's all right, Michael, uh, Code Spark Academy by the Foos. Uh, so, who has used Code Spark? I think this program is spectacular. It is award winning. Um, it is uh, it, the interesting thing about Code Spark is there's no words. I'm going to try and translate this one into a story. I visited a school um, two days ago, and they were. I, I happened to be. Uh, looking at what's called the Foster Grandparent Program, which is a program of the city to bring grandparents in and help at-need, at-risk, and, and at-need students. Anyways, I, the class I went to visit was a keyboarding class, and the kids were doing their keyboarding lessons. And when they were done, they all went to PBS Kids online, and they played PBS Kids games online. And I thought to myself, man, if they were only using CodeSpark. Because in that downtime, which was the downtime in the keyboarding class, they could have been learning incredible uh, computer science principles, uh, sequencing skills uh, that they're going to need for math and future math and future reading. So the beautiful thing about CodeSpark is it is absolutely free for teachers, and it's free with an incredible dashboard uh, that allows you to track student progress in computer science principles. And so um, uh, students love it. Uh, and it's self-directed. That's, I think, another really great thing about when you're going to use technology in the classroom. If you can have a self-directed learning, 
where students can work at a pace. And the way CodeSpark work, works, until you figure out what a repeat command does, you can't move on to the next real layer of the gamification in CodeSpark because they want you to build those coding skills with no words. And uh, it's exceptional. Um, so I didn't see if anyone had said they've played with CodeSpark. Oh, Greg's played with them at tra uh, training. Um, oh, no one replied. It makes me sad. Did anyone, has anyone used the, uh, the food before? Yeah, so this, and probably because you guys were a little upper grade levels, um, this is, you know, a lot of, because there's no words, it's traditionally thought of as an incredible entry point for uh, the elementary grades. But I think as an introduction, introduction to CS, if your school hasn't really embraced it in elementary, if they're in sixth grade and they've never coded before, this would be a, a super fun way of building those skills. Um, Greg's typing. Um, your teachers have used it. That's spectacular. Um, and Nicole put a link out there. Josh, I'll, I'll float this out there, too. That sounds great. Um, Mike, uh, so we think the world of them. Uh, Grant, the their, their founder and CEO, this is, a, this is how great companies start. He, he had a, a specific need. He wanted to help his sister learn to code. And uh, he was a computer programmer, had a sister who was much younger than him, and he couldn't believe there wasn't anything out there to help her, and so he just started building this for her. It has, it has grown tremendously. We love that it's always free for teachers, always, that they have the dashboard, like Josh mentioned. And if you go to CodeSpark.com, they actually have a full curriculum, and the last bullet there is really exciting. Uh, so there are very few, like, pre-K through two um, programming, kind of sort of computer science apps out there certainly that are free, and then that are teacher-friendly, no doubt, or no less. Uh, and then they, they just added this superfoods feature that introduces the idea of variables. Um, it's, uh, I haven't used this with, I've got a daughter that's in kindergarten, and I cannot wait to get her on the superfoods. Um, just found out about it last week uh, that they added that, that in. But this notion of introducing sort of pre-variables uh, to students, like pre-literate students, is fascinating. As students are, are developing their, their foundational literacy skills uh, and foundational math skills, the idea of giving them a variable that's not necessarily a mathematical variable, but a variable that does exactly what mathematical variables do, I think there's fascinating implications about what this does to bring computer science uh, to an elementary classroom. And their curriculum has a number of offline sort of physical interaction activities you can do, sort of those CS unplugged activities. That, that integration with the app is a really interesting way, again, to bring kind of fuse making and computer science uh, together. The top age limit for the FOOS, um, it's really, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a top age limit. We've seen a lot of fourth and fifth grade students use it and like it. It's gamified um, and sort of puzzle based, but then once you complete the puzzles, beat the levels, you gain access to items you can use in the game design side. So, you, so it's sort of two things. One is the puzzle side where you're playing through puzzles and learning how to, the basics of coding. But once you do that, you're enabled to go and make like Mario Brothers style, like side-scrolling uh, video games. And uh, yeah, I think it's an excellent way. We, there's a teacher at Greg's school, in fact, that uses this with like second, third, and fourth grade teachers. Um, and I think, you know, she actually did a webinar on here last year, and she was talking about in fourth grade, even though her students have literacy skills, this is a really interesting way to sort of spark some interest in coding, because they can literally within an hour or so begin making their own video games. Uh, it's just really, really neat. Indeed, and uh, and free. Yeah. And the teacher dashboard can't cannot be overstated. The fact that you can track individual student progress with uh, you know coding skills is is um, is really great. So moving on to our next slide as we as we get into our final final slide. Oh yeah, here. yeah. So uh, I'm assuming some of you, although you're you're all teaching kind of older grades for the most part, so maybe you've had less experience with Dash and Dot uh, and the, the tools from Wonder Workshop. I know a couple of you have experience here, so uh, feel free to fill in whatever tips and tricks. Uh, there's a ton of stuff you can do with this. So <clears throat> excuse me. So I'd love to have uh, have your input here. <laughs> Yeah, Julie, we'd be happy to help out. Um, so Dash and Dot, um, if you've seen Sphero uh, for sort of older grades, Dash and Dot is a great way to bring kind of Sphero 
to the K5, K6 space, and you could really push this up into like eighth, ninth grade if you were really kind of thinking. But what we love about this is that it's, it's a robust robot. Uh, this is not necessarily cheap. There's, this is certainly a little more expensive to, to kind of the entry point. But there are just hundreds of ways, probably thousands of ways to modify this robot to have kids engaged with like from cardboard to um, 3D printed chariots uh, to uh, sort of like cast molded um, uh, catapults. Like, it really is hard to under, like, it's hard to overstate um, the number of ways you can integrate this in your classroom. Uh, so yeah, I'm seeing a whole bunch of, yes, we love this. I'm going to stop talking and let the people say, yes, we love this. Uh, let you talk about it. Oh, what a great idea. Um, the uh, vertical, oh, yeah. you know, near-peer mentoring with your high school students, Stephanie. Do you want to uh, can, uh, forget whose microphone's working? But Stephanie, I'd love to hear more about that experience that you had doing that. And then, Nicole, if you want to turn on your microphone and, and uh, dive a little deeper into your ramps, that sounds incredible. Anyone miking up? Hey, guys, it's Julie again. We love Hey, Julie, if you could just speak close to the microphone or speak up. All levels of elementary school, and because of the different apps that you can use for it, um, it it has multiple um, ability to differentiate with one robot. So that's one thing I really love about it. Also, are you aware that Wonder Workshop just came out with a new robot called Q, and you can actually code Q that's with right. Scratch? Have you, have you used it? Have you, have you used it? We have uh, four of them. And our youngest group of robotics team is currently using it. I haven't really checked in to see how it's going. And I've got two sitting on a shelf, but I have not had the opportunity to try them out yet. You say your youngest group of robotics team. What, how young is your robotics team? So we have um, second and third graders uh, do actually dash and dot robotics. They have their own robotics competition that's uh, Wonder Workshop puts on, and they do that. And then when our we have four, we have a hybrid team with our middle school of four through sixth graders, or maybe seventh graders, that do Lego robotics. And then our high school kids do VET. Great, and thank you everyone else for all the sharing you're doing in the chat box. Greg, I don't know if you have a chance to tell your story about <laughs> coding with a senator, but that sounds interesting. Is your microphone working? Who knew more, the second yes. grader or the senator? Well, uh, Mike, were I was, you there? I or was there, there, yeah. Were you there when you were? Yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, Senator uh, from Tennessee was having issues that the girl, little girl uh, helped them figure out how to use the dash and dot robots to uh, go through the little pattern, which was kind of fun to see uh, this second grader helping this senator. Uh, after he did a, I, I guess he did a coding puzzle himself at the, at, when he first got there, which was a little difficult for him. But um, the second graders helped him out, and they were very gracious to him. That's great. <laughs> I, I'd like to just reemphasize that the, the making piece of some of these things is that idea of, of, of inquiry and tinkering, seeking opportunities to share more. So less seat time, more sharing, right? More expressive uh, opportunities. And when you have a second grader teaching a state senator, um, <laughs> does that not prove the reason why we do these things? Uh, to get students to have expertise at young, le young years where they are able to have fluency in any topic, but in such a way that they feel confident enough to share experiences. That's, a, that's really cool. That's, that's what we want to see in education. And so I think Greg's story is a perfect example of, of why Absolutely. this and, webinar you know, Just happened. to piggyback on that and push into the next piece here, it's, it's, it's also about getting kids at an early age to be able to move up 
higher levels of blooms, right, to get into synthesis and evaluation and, and really creating and doing and not just developing a baseline understanding. So I don't think it's necessarily about purchasing expensive equipment, but some of these tools, while the price tag isn't cheap and is sometimes, you know, prohibitively expensive for a number of schools, um, there are some small grants out there, but that price tag becomes worth it when it, in, when the, when the technology enables students uh, to accelerate how quickly they can move from sort of introductory level understanding to deeper engagement that, that cultivate a more robust uh, kind of learning environment. So the last, uh, the last thing that we have that integrates making with computer science, it seemed like you just couldn't do this webinar without mentioning Lego Mindstorms, um, thinking in the K-5 space. Uh, I'm going to push pretty hard that uh, we use these as early as kindergarten. And I know that's not what Lego says, um, but uh, I don't care what they say. I think it's uh, just their lawyers say that they got to say it's older kids. Um, we see this really uh, so sort of nice applications. You certainly have to scaffold it, uh, particularly the coding piece uh, for kindergarten students and really some of the building piece. Uh, but it's certainly possible to do that. Uh, we just finished a big PD with a number of STEM fellows in Southeast Tennessee, and um, I was sharing with Josh in preparation for this webinar. We were hoping to have one of the teachers on tonight, but she, uh, she had a conflict and couldn't make it at the last minute. Um, one of the things we love most, if you've never used LEGO Mindstorm, uh, it's becoming sort of a, a staple in classroom-level robotics all over the country. Um, <clears throat> oh, that's cool. Sorry, I got distracted. Stephanie, that's really neat. I haven't seen the Finch robot. I've got to check that out. Um, but they, it, it, this is becoming sort of a staple entry-level robotic uh, kind of robot. Um, what we really like about it is that it is open-ended enough in that you don't have to just, you're not boxed into a very specific kit, right? You can build a robot to suit your needs to solve your problems and then code it to do so. So there is a sort of traditional chassis, and that essentially is showing the picture here. But there are a number of ways to modify that or totally change it entirely. Um, we check these out to teachers. But what we love is that these give teachers an interesting way to integrate their core content with making and with computer science. So a lot like I think it was Chris earlier that was talking about sort of literacy. Maybe it was Chris or, or maybe it was Brian. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, talking about integrating literacy with making with computer science. This certainly does that. Um, one, the teacher that we had uh, that was coming was talking about a um, uh, late elementary school history unit on the Underground Railroad where students would have to do research about lesser known components of the Underground Railroad and then develop uh, mazes for other kids that were, that had components of the Underground Railroad in it. And then they would have, then the, the student, the, the student teams would have to then design a robot to complete the maze. It was just really Interesting. And yes, Nicole, the Edison, I forgot to, forgot to mention that. Thank you. This is why webinars should be interactive. The Edison robot is an awesome uh, option as well uh, for, for this. As, uh, that's great. I'm going to open it up here. We got like two minutes, one minute, something like that. Actually, before I open it up, I go full circle. As we open it up, Michael, imagine if your Lego Mindstorm was dragging something that was conductive and it worked alongside a makey makey. And at the same time, you had your kids turn your Lego Mindstorm into the spirit or opportunity where you 3D printed sort of re replicas of sensors on it. <laughs> Boom. Now you're okay, so I'm going to throw one thing out for you as we're, um, as we're about to close out the, uh, the webinar here. And we'll turn it over to Michelle. We do want to uh, start and end on time. So I'm going to put a link in the, uh, in the audience chat here. So um, we work, we've worked with Volkswagen, and then we've worked with a, a national funder um, we're going to be offering the, the inaugural sort of first annual uh, Chattanooga Fab Institute in Chattanooga. It is free uh, registration. I know a number of you are not from Southeast Tennessee. We're, we have a number of national uh, people coming in. We've got uh, people re registered, teachers registered from California, from Utah, from Colorado, from New York, really from all over the country coming. Uh, we'll kick off each morning with nationally recognized speakers. And um, then the rest of the day, you get to spend time in a uh, super high-tech digital fabrication lab. They're Volkswagen e-labs. They're in public schools in our, in our city. This is a free PD led by teachers for teachers, tons of hands-on with digital fabrication equipment. And we'd love to have you come. Feel free to share it around. We've still got about 90 spots open. 
So if you have any interest in that at all, we'd love to have you uh, share that and check it out. The name of the PD is the Chattanooga Fab Institute. It's the link above there, Chattanooga Fabrication Institute. And like I said, totally free. Uh, just would love to have you guys come. Uh, Josh, I think we're wrapping up here. Um, and we'll turn it over to Michelle. Yep. And thank you, everyone, for sharing and, your, uh, and uh, joining the chat log. Yep. It really made it a lot more fun for Michael and I. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael and Josh. This is a very um, interesting webinar and lots of engagement, so thanks for those uh, participating. I just want to take a couple minutes. Um, I put a link in the chat for the, uh, our webinar feedback form in case you have to drop off, um, if, you could, if you wouldn't mind taking just a couple minutes and filling that out. Um, I also wanted to mention that we have um, a couple events coming up, a couple more webinars coming up, one on April 25th on getting students to become storytellers using data, and May 15th, unplugged and, and plugged activities for CS in elementary. We also have several other webinars um, in the works, uh, so uh, uh, pay attention to our Twitter feed and our um, and our website uh, events calendar. And uh, that's it. Thank you all for joining. As a reminder, we did record this, and we will be posting this along with resources on our website um, in the next few days. Um, I will hey, leave Michelle, the room open for a couple I wanted to throw out real quick, for uh, those of you that aren't, if you're not a member, we would love to have you join uh, CS for All Teachers. It's a free community of support for, for teachers interested in computer science, doing computer, leading computer science in their school, um, or just wanting to connect. We know there's not a ton of computer science teachers comparatively to other subjects. So if you're just looking for a community of support you could tap into, ton of free resources. Uh, it's a really, really cool, thriving community. Subsections for, for like different courses you teach. If you're not a part, we'd love to have you guys join. Absolutely. Thanks for the reminder. And our, as you see, our website is on the screen, and uh, you can uh, get all Thank the information for registering there. <clears throat> Thank everyone. Thanks, Michael and Josh. And uh, I'll, as I said, I'll leave the room open for a couple minutes if there's any remaining uh, questions or comments. I think we're good. Thank you, Josh. That was fun, man. Certainly no questions or comments. Yep. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michelle. Bye.